Hello everyone, this is Pastor Brett Strohecker of New Beginnings Church in Middletown, Pennsylvania. Welcome to Holy Week 2020, and yes, here we are at home, not in church, and I know that this is bothering a lot of people out there, uh, not being able to be in church this week, so uh, we're going to do our best to make the most of this Holy Week and try to make it just like any other year uh, where we are worshiping God and we are going to take a look at the things that Jesus Christ has done for all of us. Uh, so Holy Week is always a very, very important week during the Christian calendar year. And like I said here, we're going to make the most of it as best as we can. So um, Holy Week is basically a reenacting of the passion of our Lord. And today is Sunday. And uh, there's a website out on the internet called Ken Collins' website. Uh, he's a pastor, and he has really neat stuff on his website. And I wanted to talk about the days of the week uh, while we go through this Holy Week uh, and what they signify as far as our faith in Jesus Christ. Today is Sunday, and in Judaism, Sunday was called both the first and the eighth day of the week because it was on Sunday that creation began. Uh, day one of creation was the first day of the week. And it was on the following Sunday that the new creation was open for business, so to speak. So, as the eighth day, Sunday is significant because it's on the eighth day that they normally circumcise Jewish male children. And uh, they also would give them their names. And this was true of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived. So I'm sorry, I'm going to move my phone around here, trying to get this in a position where I can talk and try to keep this steady at the same time. So um, bear with me on this. As, I, as you can see, I'm in my isolation chamber because of my dogs. My dogs have a policy that I've learned uh, since we've been home that they bark first, ask questions later. So... Uh, Sunday is also the day of the week um, uh, that had meaning to early Christians because it was on this day that Jesus arose from the dead. And we are going to be celebrating that next week in Easter. Uh, so um, basically it says in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, Very early on Sunday morning, the woman went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. So uh, this was the morning of the week. Uh, where the women went to the tomb and discovered that it was empty and, and were trying to figure out what happened with Jesus. Um, historically, uh, the Christian church has held its corporate worship services on Sunday morning. And basically we do that, you know, some people ask, well, why don't we celebrate on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, the seventh day of the week, because that's the day of the week in creation that God sanctified as a holy day because it's the day he rested from creation. Well, we celebrate and worship on the first day of the week because it is the day of the week when Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And that is the very focal point of our Christian faith. If Jesus had not arisen from the dead, then we would not have salvation uh, as he had promised us, and we would not have victory over sin and victory over death. So that's one of the reasons why we have church services on Sunday instead of having them on Saturday, which is the Sabbath day. All right. Today is Palm Sunday, the, the first day of Holy Week. And I know, uh, like I said, a lot of people are missing being able to wave the palm branches. There's also a lot of great music that you normally comes with uh, a Palm Sunday service. So I'm missing that just as much as anybody this year. However, let's talk about Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And we're looking at all four Gospels when we look at this particular event that happened in Jesus's earthly ministry. We're going to start in the Gospel of Mark chapter 11 at verse 1. It says, as Jesus and his, and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead. He told them, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it 
soon. And yes, you know, I often wondered about that uh, with the disciples going out and getting this donkey as Jesus asked them to. I'm sure, of course, they would return it. But the Gospel of Mark is the one gospel that says that uh, the Lord instructs him, look, tell them that I need it and we will return it as soon as it's done. So uh, if you ever wondered about that, there's a little tidbit that can often slip past us on Palm Sunday. Now, that's how Mark sets the stage for us. Jesus is getting ready to enter into Jerusalem, and he's going to enter into it riding on the back of a donkey, and that's important. Why? Because in Matthew chapter 21, verses 4 and 5, it says, This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So Matthew is pointing out, you know, and this is typical Matthew gospel. Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament for a reason, because he ties the Old Testament with the New Testament. And here he's telling us, look, the reason why Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that triumphant entry on the back of a donkey is because it fulfilled prophecy that was said this is going to happen. And as we know that when God says something, he always keeps his word. He told the prophet Isaiah that, look, I always keep my word. So here he is. He's saying, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So we go back to Mark chapter 11, at starting at verse 4. It says, the two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied alongside the front door. As they were untying it, Hold on a second. I got to get my computer to cooperate with me. Some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? Now think about that. You know, in today's world, uh, you know, it'd be like somebody seeing, oh, they're going to borrow this guy's car or borrow this something from somebody's house. And they just see him taking it. I think in today's world, that would be a 911 call where someone would be like, look, someone's stealing something over there. Or I don't understand what, who these guys are and what they think they're doing taking our neighbor's property. But it says here that there were bystanders there that said, what are you doing untying that colt? And then they said what Jesus told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. So they said, look, the Lord's need it, the Lord needs it, and we will return it. So, you know, there was a sense of trust back in the day. They were being neighborly. Oh, you want to borrow the donkey? Fine, as long as you return it. Uh, that's what's going on here. And they said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. So they went ahead and told the people what Jesus told them to say, and the people allowed them to use the donkey. So they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. So the first garments that were thrown down on Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem were those of his disciples on the back of the donkey so that he could sit upon the back of the donkey. And let me put a little footnote here. Um, how many of you have been out to a farm and actually looked at a donkey? I mean, they're kind of... Uh, strange animals are known for their stubbornness, um, and people know them for the noise they make. I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to do any impressions here. Uh, but the thing that I think gets often overlooked on donkeys is if you look at the fur on their back, you can literally see a brown cross in brown fur or black fur. Uh, there's a cross on the back. There's a line that goes right down near their spinal cord, and there's a line that goes across at the shoulder. So it looks like a cross on the back of a donkey. I always found that very, very interesting. In fact, I, I officiated a wedding uh, not too long ago, and it was an outdoor wedding, and it was on a farm, and there were two donkeys actually roaming around during the reception area, and I made it a point to go take a look at them because they were pretty tame, and uh, I actually viewed the cross that was on the back of the donkey, so I thought that was very interesting, but the disciples put their garments on the back of the donkey, and Jesus, of course, got on top of the donkey to ride into Jerusalem, so let's pick it up now with the Gospel of John in chapter 12 at verse 12. It says, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. So when Jesus was preparing to come into Jerusalem, news about his arrival was already sweeping through the city. So people were excited about his appearance in Jerusalem. 
And it says here, uh, and at verse 12, continuing in verse 12 of John chapter 12, a large crowd of Passover visitors. Now, that's very important. People were gathered in Jerusalem because the temple's there, and they're gathered there for what reason? For Passover, one of the Jewish festivals. So they're getting ready for Passover, and Passover plays in big on Holy Week. We'll talk more about that as the week goes on. But here it says, a large crowd of Passover visitors were gathered there in Jerusalem. Uh, and the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. Okay, so the what did the crowd do? They took palm branches and went down the road to the road to meet him. And they shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. So think about this. They're there for Passover. They're celebrating that Jewish festival. They hear Jesus is coming. They grab palm branches and run down to the road to meet him. And they start shouting out praises to him. Now think about this. This is very important because if he was just some ordinary guy showing up in a city, they wouldn't be taking palm branches off the trees and waving it at them and shouting to them. They were out to meet him. And this is kind of like an acknowledgement that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. A lot of people heard about Jesus and the things that he was doing. And finally, we see some things uh, other than uh, individuals that are, it's a crowd of people right now that are proclaiming that he is uh, the one that comes in the name of the Lord and he is king of Israel. So, you know, they are excited about his coming and they are greeting him as a king. So now we jump back to Matthew 21 at verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting. And let me get down here. What were they shouting? Again, praise, be, praise God for the Son of David. Very important, because where would the Messiah show up? Whose line does the Messiah come from? David's line. That's prophecy. So they're acknowledging prophecy about the Messiah, and they're greeting him as he's coming down the road into Jerusalem. So they said, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. People are shouting praises to God. Why? Because the liberator is here. The redeemer is here. The king is here. And they're acknowledging this. This is very, very important. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar, as it states here in verse 10, as he entered the city. Who? Jesus entering the city. So the whole city is in an uproar because Jesus is coming. So now this is not only drawing attention to the people that went out to greet Jesus. Now it's starting to draw everyone's attention to Jerusalem. What's going on? You know, it's like, um, uh, I remember, uh, when I was growing up in Middletown, uh, whenever there was a fire call, they would blow the fire sirens on top of the firehouses and they made a lot of noise. And when people heard those sirens, they knew something was up and people sometimes would go out and look and sometimes they'd see a column of smoke coming up, uh, out of the town and, and people would rush over to see, oh my gosh, what's going on? Whose house is on fire? What's, what's happening? Uh, what's going on? Where's this at? And this is kind of what's going on here in Jerusalem. You know, people heard that Jesus is coming. They went out to the road and start shouting praises to him. They're waving branches. They're putting branches down the road. They're putting garments down the road. Think about this. You know, they're putting their coats from their, from off their backs down on the road so that the donkey could walk across them carrying Jesus. Uh, so, you know, this is starting to become a spectacle where all of a sudden everybody else is in an uproar about what's going on. So then what is the most common question that you would think would be happening at this point? You know, people are going to say, what is going on? But then when they see Jesus coming in on the back of a donkey, they're going to be like, Who is this guy? And that's exactly what they ask here, according to verse 10. They, they, as it says, the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? They ask. And in verse 11, the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. So 
Here people are acknowledging Jesus. They're naming him. They're calling him uh, the, the son of David. So they're acknowledging that he is coming from David's line, just like the Messiah would come from David's line. They're saying he is the one who's coming in the name of the Lord. Another reference to the Messiah. And then they're praising God in heaven. Why? Because God has fulfilled his promise of sending the Messiah. So this is huge. And this is Sunday. We haven't even got to Friday yet. So notice the contrast here. We all know the Easter story. And when we look at Sunday, Sunday is much different than what's going on, what's going to happen on Friday. Sunday, everybody's real happy that Jesus is there. Um, so we go back now to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, and we pick it up at verse 37. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Now, think about this. We've gone now from people rushing out to greet Jesus, and now that he's there, they've greeted him, and now some of them are walking along, singing praises to him. And again, notice what they're saying. The king who comes in the name of the Lord. Another reference to the Messiah. Peace in heaven. What is the Messiah supposed to bring between God and the people here on earth? Peace and glory in highest heaven. This all glorifies God because he has fulfilled his promise of salvation to the people that they've heard about. And think about it. It's been over 400 years since they first started hearing those prophecies. Those prophecies have been passed down for over 400 years. Now these people are actually witnessing what's going on here. But now here's where things get out of control because all this ruckus and uproar is happening, and of course the Pharisees are going to hear about it, and they show up. So in verse 39 of Luke chapter 19, we see where they step into this event that's happening here. It says, but some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, and they're talking to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. So in other words, the Pharisees are saying, look, these people are thinking that you're the Messiah. These people are calling you the son of David. Uh, they're, they're calling you the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We're not liking this. So, you know, this, this is not real good uh, with us. So we need you to stop all this. So they say, they say to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And here's one of the best responses I see Jesus give out of all the gospels. I love what he says here. So Jesus replies to them in verse 40, if they keep quiet, in other words, the crowds that are out there making all this noise and doing all this praise and all this singing, you know, think about this, man. This is this is like praise and worship time uh, at church, where these people are shouting out praises to the Lord. They're singing uh, and, and they're glorifying uh, God for doing the things that He said He would do in His holy word. But Jesus says, "Look." You guys, you Pharisees want me to quiet this crowd down? Look, if I did that, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst in the cheers. Think about that statement. If I tell all these people out here to be quiet, I assure you the stones along the road would burst in the cheers. So this is how this should tell you or give you some idea of how grand an event this was, how important an event this was. So, uh, you know, we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and we've all heard this story. We've all been through Palm Sunday time and time and again. But these are how the four different uh, Gospels describe it. And, and the people are acknowledging that, look, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that fulfills the prophecies that we've heard about for over 400 years. They're acknowledging all this, much to the point where the Pharisees are upset that they're acknowledging this. Because the Pharisees are like, look, if anybody's going to be able to, to identify the Messiah, it would be us. We would know because we're the ones that are teaching you what's in the scrolls, uh, what's in the prophecies. We're the ones that are holding services each week, and we're the ones that have educated you on this, and we're trying to tell you that this isn't the guy. And Jesus is like, look, you can try to keep these people uh, quiet all you want, but 
Uh, what they're speaking here is truth. This is kind of Jesus' way of saying, look, this is the truth, and you guys need to wake up to the truth. Because even if I told these people to be quiet, the rocks along the road would burst into cheers. So then let's go over to something that kind of gets overlooked on Palm Sunday, and it's verses 16 through 19 on, in John chapter 12. Now it says, this is all going on. We've described and, and set the scene here, and we've talked about what happened and the things that were said. Uh, and in the background, of course, the disciples are with Jesus witnessing all this. And it says here in verse 16 of John chapter 12, his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, think about that statement. They too have heard what was read from the scrolls in synagogue and in the temple uh, and in the religious teachings of their day, but they didn't realize at the time, look, this is fulfillment of prophecy. So what does that say about them? It doesn't say that they didn't have faith in Jesus. It just says that, look, things that they have seen and witnessed and have done and have in their travels with Jesus and all the things, think about the things that he, they saw during their time with him. Sorry, I'm trying to keep this phone steady here. Uh, in their time with him, and they're trying to make sense of it all. They're overwhelmed. And now, think about it. You know, all the things they've seen. And right before this event is when Jesus actually raised Lazarus from the dead. So they're still in shock from that event. And now this event comes along and people are going crazy. They're happy to see Jesus. They're singing praises to him. Uh, they are affirming that he is the Messiah. They are affirming that he is uh, the one who comes in the name of the Lord from the line of David. And they're just overwhelmed. They're like, wow, all, all this time and people are getting that this is the guy. And it was kind of an affirmation for them, you know, because they knew, look, that Jesus is the Messiah or else they wouldn't have been following him. But think about it. They've seen many different things, and, and it's just been really difficult for them to take in because we're all human beings. And, and uh, if we put ourselves in their shoes and think about the things that they have seen, my goodness, no wonder they're overwhelmed. So the, his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remember what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. So what's the Bible saying here in the Gospel of John? It's saying that after Jesus ascended into heaven and the disciples were in that aftermath of, okay, where do we go from here? Uh, they realized and they were reflecting back on this day when Jesus entered into Jerusalem and they realized at that point this was a fulfillment of prophecy, and it started making sense to them. And think about it. This goes to show how overwhelmed they were, and, and it just goes to show how amazed they were at the things that they witnessed while they were with Jesus, okay? So it says here, that, you know, at, at the later point, at some time after this, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples reflected on this day and realized, wow. This is just more affirmation for us because it shows that it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, here's another thing too. Verse 17 in this uh, John chapter 12. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb. So a lot of people that were there were like, look, uh, we think this guy is a real deal because we saw what he did with, at Lazarus' tomb. Uh, you know, think about that setting. The, Lazarus was dead for several days. And back in their time, that was a, a significant thing because that really signified that, that Lazarus was indeed dead. In fact, you know, when Jesus asked the stone to be rolled away, they're like, oh, we can't really do that right now, master, because, you know, the stench is going to be just overwhelming because he's been dead for a while. And uh, Jesus said, no, you still got to roll the stone away. So a lot of people that are there waving the palm branches, laying them down on the road and putting the garments down ahead of him uh, were ones that witnessed what Jesus did at Lazarus' tomb. And think about it. I can picture it in my mind. All these people are at the tomb. The tomb sealed up. And, you know, that's like us standing graveside somewhere. And we're like, okay, well, what are you going to do now, Jesus? Because, unfortunately, the guy is dead. You know, he passed away. There's really nothing that can be done right now. But Jesus said, hey, roll the stone away. And I'm sure people are like, what is he up to? Why is he doing this? And he had the stone rolled away. And he said, you know, and then... 
They were watching him. I can imagine them watching Jesus. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And I can, I can imagine that moment that all eyes and all heads turned from looking at Jesus to whipping that to that open tomb to see what would happen. And they saw Lazarus walking out all wrapped up, still embalmed and everything from passing away, from being dead. He was all wrapped up and he walked out of the tomb. These people that are there on his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, many of them have witnesses. And this is what John, the Gospel of John chapter 12 is telling us. Verse 17, many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. So they're still buzzing about this. That was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there is nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. So the, the, the Pharisees were kind of at this point throwing up their hands saying, look, we've resisted him the whole, every step of the way. And look, these people are now convinced. I mean, you know, we heard about what happened with Lazarus' tomb, and now these same people that saw that are out here, and it's obvious they're convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. That's kind of the Pharisees' thinking at this point. In John, uh, the gospel, I love that it's added in here in verses 16 to 19 uh, that, look, this is kind of a culmination of Jesus' ministry uh, and is leading up to the events that are going to happen on Friday of this week. So, um, and think about this, you know, people have heard, uh, this so-called story, uh, for years, but it's an actual historic event. And it has a lot of detail here. Uh, why were people gathered in Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem was the site of the temple and they were gathered there for the festival of Passover, something that they would be doing at the time. And, you know, it's kind of crazy because, uh, there were professional mourners and stuff like that back in their day. So, uh, you know, some of them maybe along the journey stopped by uh, for Lazarus's funeral because they were still in mourning over his passing. And they saw this miraculous sign from Christ and it just kind of carried over into Jerusalem. So you see how all these events are coming together just as part of God's master plan. And, you know, and people back then, they they obviously didn't realize uh, how all this is coming together. That's why it's it's fortunate for us. We can look back in hindsight now through the pages of the gospel and see these events and understand why God had them happen in the manner they did because it was setting the stage for the supreme moment in human history. The moment that is at the top of the list of the most important moments in human history that it impacted all of human civilization. So, that was Christ in his first coming, so to speak, uh, coming in where people are finally acknowledging him. Look, this is the Messiah. This is the one that the prophets spoke about. But let us not overlook the fact that uh, we are probably in our own lifetimes going to see his return. And we'll see it in one of two ways. Uh, we'll see it if he comes to call us home when our life and time here is done here on earth, or we may be here to witness that day that only God knows about where Jesus will return in his second coming. And in fact, if we go back to the New Testament, uh, we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 18, this language here, and I want to read all this for you. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back, bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living, when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then will we we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. What's the Bible telling us here? Well, we have to remember what Jesus said. Someday I'm coming back. 
And what did he say about that day? Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. So only God knows when that's going to happen. Only God knows when he's going to wrap up uh, all of human history with the second coming of Christ. And it says here um, that, look, there are many of those who are faithful followers of Christ who have been called home by him already. But when he returns, Jesus is going to gather all those that have preceded us in death and bring them back to life through resurrection. Because, you know, we don't talk enough about talk. Oh, are we still here? Looks like we had a little glitch there for a second. I hope we're still here. But anyway, um, basically, you know, Jesus is going to resurrect those who have preceded us in death. And now uh, it says here that when he returns, they will be with him and we will all meet him and be gathered up unto him in the air. And that's when we're going to be uh, lifted away from this life forever and we will be out with him and taken up into heaven with him. Uh, and, you know, that's the rapture. Many people refer to that as the rapture. And uh, basically what the important thing is, is today we celebrate his first coming where he was acknowledged as Messiah as he was coming into Jerusalem. But we have to remember that someday he will return. And that day is going to happen in our lifetime one of two ways. He will come to get us uh, when our time here on earth is done, or it may be that day. And the question is, are you ready for that day? That's why it's so important that, you know, people often wonder, well, why is it that uh, you get to the end of the things that you're doing uh, in church or online and you always talk about those who don't know Christ as Savior and Lord of their life? Well, folks, that's the most important decision that anybody can make in their life. And you know, people think that we just exist here. You know, you see all these things that have YOLO on them. Y-O-L-O. -O, you only live once. That's not a way to look at life, okay? Look at life. You try to do the things that you uh, want to do um, that are going to be pleasing to, Lord, to the Lord and glorify God, but also uh, fulfill his calling that he has in your life and, and the plan he has for you and the purpose he has for you. Uh, because, you know, when it, what it all comes down to is every one of us wants to discover what the meaning of our life is. And we won't discover that meaning without Jesus, because only Jesus and the Holy Spirit can help us realize uh, the meaning of all this. So that's why it's so important that whenever you talk about uh, Jesus, if you already know him as Lord and Savior in your life and confess him as such, uh, you need to pass along that information to others. Now that, you know, I'm reading a good book right now. It says you don't need to win them for Christ. You allow Christ to take care of that part. What you are is the messenger. You need to get the word out about what Jesus has done for you, what Jesus has done in your life. Give your personal testimony because every single one of us that's saved, that knows Jesus as Lord and Savior of her life, um, it is has a personal testimony. And that's why it's so important, you know, at the end of these, I always want to say to those of you that are out there that may be listening at this time that don't know him or confess him as Lord and Savior of your life, all you have to do is ask him to come into your life. It's not going to be, you know, you may be surrounded by angels. You may not be surrounded by angels. It may be something that is, uh, has great significance for it. Well, it does have great significance, but it doesn't mean that something dramatic is going to happen when you do this. It, you know, it, you may feel the same as you did before you did this, but the most important thing is that you call upon the name of the Lord because the Bible says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So all you got to do is call out to him and invite him into your life. And if you do that, uh, I'm, I guarantee you, you're going to see your life change from the inside out. And it might take a long time. It might take a short time. But it's going to take what the Lord has determined as the timing for it. But you have to be open to him. You have to have a personal relationship with him in order for that change to occur. So that is why it's important for us believers to get out there and say, look, this is what the Lord has done for me in my life, and he can change your life too. All you have to do is ask him to come into your life. That's all God is asking us to do. People are worried about, well, did you save that person? Only Jesus saves. Did you win that person back to Christ? Well, no, that's a personal decision between them and the Lord. We just have to be the messenger. 
And as the messenger, uh, like I said, we tell them everything that Jesus has done for us and the difference that Jesus has made in our life. I'm sorry for moving the, the phone again. Uh, but um, all we have to do is encourage them, look, if you want Jesus to come into your life, it's a simple matter of praying. And the prayer goes something like this. And, and if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, here's the prayer that you should say. Lord, I recognize and acknowledge the fact that I am a sinner. I have sinned against you uh, knowingly and unknowingly. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I've done things I shouldn't have done. Uh, sometimes I was silent when I needed to speak up. Sometimes uh, there was a time for me to act and I didn't act. Uh, sometimes there was an opportunity for me to help others and I didn't. Uh, or sometimes there was a, a time where someone needed me and I wasn't there for them. Lord, I've sinned against you in so many different ways and I've left you down in so many different ways. But I acknowledge the Bible says that all are sinners and all have fallen short of your glorious standards. So Lord, I humble myself before you and I acknowledge that I'm not perfect and I acknowledge my sin before you and I ask, Lord, that you would forgive me. And I know that forgiveness is available because I thank you for sending Jesus to come into the this world and show us a better way of life and show us a better way of living and to take my place and take on my punishment for my sins by going to the cross and dying there for me, being buried for three days and then on the third day being rose from the dead victorious over sin, victorious over death. I acknowledge that and I accept that as truth in my life. And I thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, for doing that for me. So now I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and into my life and be a part of me. Help me to develop a personal relationship with you. And Lord, I ask you now to change me from the inside out so that I can have a better life from this day forward. Help me to understand the things that are wrong in my life and I can make the changes through you and help me to see the changes you want me to make. And Lord, I just ask uh, that you walk with me and that you surround me with others who are your followers and love you. And Lord, I declare my love for you today. And I give my life to you today, for it's in your name I pray. Amen. It's as simple as that. And if you have prayed that prayer with me today, well, then you have just entered into a whole new life and a whole new world. And, and think about the times we live in right now. Uh, now is the time to make the change. Now is the time to uh, make things better. I know we're all chomping at the bit for this whole virus situation to be done so that we can move on for our lives. Well, let's not wait until the end of the virus situation to move on for our lives. Let's make some choices that are positive for the Lord today so that we can move on into a better life and uh, already be living it when this crisis has passed. So um, I thank everyone for listening today. Um, hold on. My arms are getting tired holding this thing up. I really got to get something to hold this thing up. And again, some of you may be wondering, why am I in my car? Well, my dog, oh, we are keep going, fading in and out here. Sorry about that. But anyway, um, a couple quick announcements. Uh, the church is still closed uh, as far as the Riverside Chapel goes. But we're going to try to figure out a way to do uh, Bible study through uh, something called Zoom. Uh, and some of you may know what Zoom is. I don't. I'm not familiar. I'm not Zoom qualified, I guess. But I'm soon going to be Zoom qualified. And if we can get that running for uh, uh, this Thursday, then maybe we can have Bible study on Thursday night. So more to come on that. As far as Easter services are going, um, I'm going to try to do something sunrise down by the cross by the church, not asking anybody to show up with me. I'm going to do it on here live uh, on the internet because we're st still supposed to be practicing social distancing. So uh, I am going to be on here live uh, from the cross on Sunday morning. It will regularly be our sunrise service. And I'm also going to see if I can uh, be there for Thursday night um, uh well, you know, if we're going to have Bible study, I'm also going to try to do something uh, regarding a little bit of a sermon on Thursday night for Monday, Thursday, as well as a little bit of a sermon next Friday for Good Friday. So, um, you know, we're going to try to fulfill a lot of the Easter week things, the Holy Week things that we're doing uh, normally at the church that we can't necessarily do this year because of the situation we have with this virus. We are recording an Easter service that's going to be posted on our website. And I'll tell you what. I'm really excited because it seems to me that, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have been out to our website, but it hasn't been updated and we haven't used it effectively as a church. But I think 
we've reached a turning point with this. So if there's one good thing uh, that will come out of this fire situation, I think we're going to be rocking and rolling on the website here very soon. So uh, we are going to be recording a video service for Easter that we will post on the website. And I have been assured that the audio from that service will be able to be used for our radio broadcast uh, next uh, Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock on WMSS. 91.1 FM. Now, we did record another new service for WMSS that will be aired today at 3 p.m. So, uh, you know, stay tune in for that. It's WMSS 91.1 FM. I want to thank John Wilsbach and the folks at WMSS for uh, making that available to us and, and uh, uh, making that happen for us even in this virus time. So, uh, we're going to have a new service on there this afternoon. And I'm also going to be live tomorrow night for what would normally be our New Beginnings Unchained. So uh, probably be live Monday night at 7 uh, and then Thursday night, uh, depending if we're having Bible study or night or not, I will be live that night for Monday, Thursday. Uh, I'll give you details once we figure out what we're doing with Bible study. And then Friday afternoon next week, uh, sometime between 12 and 3, I'll be on here live uh, to do some Good Friday stuff. And then Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, we'll have the video service available on the Internet, on our website. And I'll provide details on the website later. Uh, and then uh, we will also be live on here for the sunrise stuff that we would normally do, sunrise service. So uh, we're going to try to make the most of this Holy Week, even under the circumstances that we have this year. So uh, I thank you all for listening today. Let's say a quick prayer together and we'll wrap things up. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone that has been watching this today. Uh, I just pray today that Lord... Uh, like so many years ago when you were welcomed into Jerusalem, I pray that there are many that are still welcoming you into their lives today. Uh, those that know you already as, and confess you already as Lord and Savior of, your, of their lives and those that are struggling with that decision, Lord, help them to make that choice for you so that they can see that their lives indeed can be changed by you from the inside out. Uh, Lord, have a blessing on all those that are dealing with the coronavirus uh, keep our medical community safe. Uh, be with those that have been uh, have contacted it or contracted it through um, how contagious it is. Uh, put your healing touch upon them and be with all those families who have lost loved ones as a result of this virus. Uh, be with our leadership as they try to guide our nation and our state and our communities through this time of crisis and help us all, Lord, to be mindful of each other so that we can stop the spread of this virus and lower the curve so that we can take care of our brothers and sisters that are working so hard and so diligently out there in the medical community. We give you thanks and praise for them and we pray for a special blessing to be upon them as well. Uh, we pray for all those that are on our church prayer list that are dealing with health issues other than the virus, uh, that are struggling with personal issues, uh, that are mourning the death of loved ones, that are serving our nation and the armed forces, uh, who need your guidance in some way, those that are incarcerated, uh, those that are persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ, as well as our shut-ins, especially our shut-ins, Lord, uh, who are not able to receive visitors at this time. Help us to be mindful of them and, and send calls to them and letters to them uh, and cards to them and help them to uh, feel visited and appreciated even though we can't go see them in person. So, Lord, we lift all these things up before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who also taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, I hope everybody has a good day. Uh, tune in to WMSS this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Uh, we have our fifth Sunday testimonial that's going to be in there as well. There's going to be a sermon and a fifth Sunday testimonial in there. So it's kind of, uh, it is a special service for our Palm Sunday today. Uh, I really wish we could be there in person, but, uh, everybody stay safe and healthy. And remember nothing in this world is more important than the love of Jesus Christ. I'll talk to you soon.